Hi there, my highly valued, treasured, and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference where patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for a high impact pharmacotherapy services. So, I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share some tips with you which you may find very handy and useful in your line of duty. So I welcome you to part 64 of our MCQ pharmacotherapy MCQ series measuring in transplantation pharmacotherapy. Welcome. Question number one reads your cardiac team admits Mr. W.O.C., a 57-year-old male, to the coronary care unit for advanced heart failure care. They schedule the replacement of an left ventricular assist device. He has a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, is hypertensive, and he also suffers from coronary artery disease. He has been admitted at your hospital for six weeks. And uh, in the course of this hospitalization, small bowel obstruction complicated his management. He now receives TPN. He is also being managed for an osocomial pneumonia using 4.5 grams of piperacillin tazobactam infused over four hours, four times daily, and is on day 10 of therapy. So my question to you is, which of the factors listed below would be an indication to consider perioperative fungal prophylaxis, antifungal prophylaxis, sorry, according to the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation Guidelines? Is it TPN, prolonged hospitalization, broad spectrum antibiotics that is exceeding 48 hours, or none of the above. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So both TPN and broad spectrum antibiotics for prolonged durations uh, can increase this risk. Now the International Society for Heart and Lung transplantation guidelines recommend consideration of perioperative antifungal prophylaxis for patients colonized with candida at more than three sites. It also recommends the same for patients receiving total parental nutrition or for patients on broad spectrum antibiotics for a duration of over 48 to 72 hours. Now, I would like to comment that we should consider perioperative fluconazole administration at the first time of device implantation for patients receiving TPN or those on broad spectrum antibiotics for a period exceeding 48 to 72 hours before device placement or even those with recent colonization with candida. It's backed by literature. Now, routine perioperative antifungal prophylaxis isn't recommended for low-risk patients. It would be a waste of resources. And I would like to add that fluconazole is dose adjusted for creatinine clearances below the 50 mark. Now, when treating such patients, you should administer a full initial dose based on the indication and then the subsequent doses should be reduced by 50%. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. The question reads, 
Mrs. K.J. Yu, a 44-year-old female patient who underwent heart transplantation for hepatocellular carcinoma, abbreviated as HCC, 90 days ago, three months ago, is admitted to your hospital for concerns of small bowel obstruction, which we abbreviate as SBO and or ileus. Now, prior to her current admission, Mrs. KJU was well maintained on the following immunosuppressant regimen. She was taking three milligrams of tacrolimus orally twice daily, a gram of mycophenolate morphetil twice a day, and five milligrams of prednisone orally once daily. Her tacrolimus levels on admission were 4.2 nanograms per ml, but the previous clinic data shows KJU had previously been therapeutic on her dose of tacrolimus. Now, given the concerns for SBO, your transplant team is questioning whether this patient is absorbing her medication and they plan to switch her to the sublingual form of tacrolimus. So my question to you is, which of the options listed below represents the correct conversion from oral to sublingual tacrolimus for Mrs. KJU based on her home dose? Would you opt to switch her to 3 mg of tacrolimus sublingually twice daily? Or would you settle for 3 mg sublingually once a day? Or would you switch to 1.5 mg sublingually twice a day? Or would you increase the dose by doubling it to 6 mg sublingually twice a day? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Would settle for 1.5 sublingually twice daily and I'll tell you the reason why. Now when converting from oral to sublingual tacrolimus, a reasonable conversion factor is 2 to 1 that is oral to sublingual. The frequency of administration should not change. So the OD regimen in alternative B is wrong. Now, alternative D, increasing the dose by doubling it would drastically increase the tacrolimus levels, increasing the risks of adverse effects. So I would not settle for D either. And, uh, both answers A and B are wrong as well. Yeah, you cannot maintain the same oral dose and shift to the sublingual route. We have to half the dose to avoid toxicity. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads: Mrs. S. M. K., a 29-year-old Caucasian female patient with F. S. G. S., presents to your hospital. She is status post diseased donor kidney transplantation seven months ago. Her serum creatinine was found to be 2.6. Now at baseline it was 1.6. She complains of accompanying malaise and fatigue and your transplant team admits her for further workup. Her maintenance immunosuppression includes 4 mg of tacrolimus taken orally twice daily, a gram of mycophenolate morphetil taken orally twice a day, and 5 mg of prednisone taken orally once a day. Prophylactically, she takes 900 mg of van valgan cyclovir for CMV prophylaxis orally twice a day, and uh, a tablet of Bactrim DS twice daily for PCP prophylaxis. Some of her pertinent inpatient lab results include a sodium level of 137, potassium of 4.2, a BUN of 56, serum creatinine of 2.6, magnesium of 1.7, ST of 23, LT of 27, 
and the CMV viral load is 3080. Uh, Read biopsy results are pending. Uh, blood and urine blood cultures are pending. So my question to you is basing on this provided data, which of the actions listed below would be the most appropriate regarding um, Mr. SMK's maintenance immunosuppression? Would you opt to hold maintenance immunosuppression? Would you decrease the overall maintenance immunosuppression? We do discontinue overall maintenance immunosuppression and reinitiate induction therapy. Or would you increase overall maintenance immunosuppression? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would opt to decrease overall maintenance immunosuppression. I'll tell you the reason why. Now, the labs indicate SMK stachrolimus level is high and uh, she has an active CMV viremia of 3080. Uh, management of CMV viremia includes reducing maintenance immunosuppression in the presence of an opportunistic infection. Now we shouldn't completely withhold immunosuppression medication due to the risk of rejection. So that makes A wrong and B correct. Then I would like to add that tacrolimus level is already elevated and the presence of an opportunistic infection indicates a degree of over immunosuppression. Therefore, that makes alternative D wrong. We cannot increase it. There is already over immunosuppression. So all we can do is decrease it and not increase it. Then I would like to add that reinitiation of induction therapy wouldn't be appropriate at this time. It isn't a therapeutic option for the treatment of CMV. I would like to remind you that reducing immunosuppression could include holding corticosteroids, reducing or totally eliminating the dose of mycophenolate morphetil, and or reducing the tacrolimus dose. So all those many words make alternative B our correct choice. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads... Mr. LJO, a 32-year-old male patient who is six months status post-deceased donor kidney transplant, was admitted to your hospital for increasing serum creatinine, fatigue, and malaise. His estimated creatinine clearance is 35 ml per minute, and initial laboratory workup reveals a CMV viral load of 1,822 international units per ml. So my question to you is, which of the treatment options listed below would best suit LJO's case now now? Would you opt to administer veil acyclovir at a dose of one gram orally twice a day? Or would you opt for ganciclovir at a dose of 0 0.125 milligrams per kilo IV once a day or would you opt for val ganciclovir at a dose of 450 milligrams orally once a day or would you settle for aciclovir at a dose of 800 milligrams every six hours I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So I would opt for val ganciclovir at a dose of 450 milligrams orally once daily. Now, answer B represents the dose of ganciclovir used prophylactically against CMV for creatinine clearance values between 25 and 49 
ml per minute not for the treatment dose of 2.5 milligrams per kilo IV now answer C in my opinion is correct the correct dosing for treatment of CMV with this patient's renal function in mind and I would like to add that both aciclovir and val aciclovir aren't recommended by the CMV consensus, consensus guidelines for the treatment of CMV at all at all they have no place and uh, I would like to add that dosed appropriately val gansiclovir and gansiclovir are preferred treatment options it can also be used prophylactically for the prevention of CMV and both of them require different dosing for either treatment versus prophylaxis of CMV in immune compromised patients and uh, both of them require renal dose adjustments so be very very careful when you're managing transplant patients with kidney issues using these two drugs let's move to the next slide this and it reads your transplant team is reviewing your institutional mechanical circulatory support device patient education material and the team seeks to include information on left ventricular assist devices what we call the LVADs and infection risk so my question to you is which of the infectious complications listed below is most commonly associated with LVADs which should be included in this reviewed educational material that your team seeks to draft would it be pneumonia would it be driveline exit site infection would it be bacteremia or mediastinitis i'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer So the correct answer is driveline exit site infection now infections of the driveline exit site is the most common infectious complication associated with LVADs bacteremia and medianis, mediastinitis associated with the, the device may occur as well but these are less common than driveline infections now pneumonia isn't specifically associated with LVAD so that makes that answer wrong and I would like to add that LVAD driveline infections are common complications associated with significant morbidity and mortality so be very careful treat them with the seriousness they deserve now gram positive cocci such as staph aureus or strep epidemides and even corine bacteria species are the most commonly isolated organisms sorry associated with the driveline infections therefore patients should be counseled to dress and clean the driveline exit site regularly in a sterile fashion they should observe hand hygiene eh? then i would like to add that pump pocket infection and bacteria may result from pathogen entry at the drive line exit site so be very careful when handling these devices to avoid serious complications let's move to the next slide please and the question reads which of the mechanisms of action listed below applies to mycophenolate morphetil is it true that it's an anti-proliferative agent which inhibits T cells and B cells or is it true that it's an anti-proliferative agent which only inhibits the B cells or is it true that it's an anti-proliferative agent which inhibits only the T cells or is it true that it's an anti-proliferative agent which has no activity on both B and T lymphocytes I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer
So A is the correct answer. Mycophenolate morphate is an antiproliferative agent which inhibits both T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Uh, I would like to add that answer D is incorrect because it depletes guanosine in both the T cells and the B cells. Now, mycophenolate morphetin is a prodrug of mycophenolic acid, which is an inhibitor of inosine 5 prime monophosphate dihydrogenase. Now, this results in preferable or preferential depleting of guanosine in both T and B lymphocytes and that leads to inhibition of their proliferation. That's the mechanism by which mycophenolate morphetil works in this transplantation pharmacotherapy. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the next question reads, which of the pre-transplantation descriptions listed below most accurately describes a patient with the highest risk for transplant rejection? Would it be a 37-year-old black male patient undergoing diseased donor kidney transplantation, which we abbreviate as DDKT? Or would it be a 66-year-old Caucasian female patient with no children? Or would it be a 48-year-old black female patient receiving a kidney transplant from her twin sister? Or would it be a 71-year-old Caucasian male who has been on hemodialysis for the past 10 years? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So A would be the correct answer. 37 year old black men patient that are going diseased donor kidney transplantation. Now I would like to start by saying commenting that answer D is wrong because elderly patients aren't considered as high immunogenic risk as compared to younger patients in the age group of below the 45 to 50 years of age. Now, I would also like to add that uh, the duration of hemodialysis isn't associated with an increased immunologic risk. So that also makes answer D wrong. And I would like to add that a patient receiving a kidney transplant from a twin sister represents a low immunologic risk for rejection due to the optimization of HLA matching. I would like to add that younger patients, like the one in answer A, are at a higher risk of rejection, and uh, that's usually due to a more active immune system. Such patients are able to mount a stronger immune response than the elderly patients. Now, answer B, in my opinion, is wrong because this patient is older, and the fact that she has no children means she hasn't had sensitization from pregnancy. I would like to add that pre-transplant risk factors for rejection include younger age, that is below the 45 to 55 year bracket, and uh, this age group or this bracket seems to be an important threshold in immunologic risk. The black race is also a risk factor, whether they are African-American ethnicity or uh, African origin. And there's also the PRA above zero and even performed HLA DSA where the figure is above 5000 MFI and even uh, patients who have had sensitizing events which include pregnancy, blood transfusion and previous transplant. All these patients are at an increased risk of uh, rejection because of the 
immunologic response they would mount. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads, which of the counseling points listed below is important for patients discharged with new left ventricular assist devices? Would it be, be consistent in your intake of dietary vitamin K from foods or supplements? Or would it be, always carry backup power sources and equipment when traveling? Or would it be, don't swim or submerge yourselves in water? Or would it be perform driveline exit site care in a sterile fashion? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. In a long time, all the four answers are correct. All of the above are important counseling points for patients with left ventricular assist devices. Now, patients may shower with the device, but this device can't be and shouldn't be submerged in water. Now, left ventricular assist devices require uninterrupted power supply. Therefore, we should always remember to ensure the batteries don't go flat. Now, the batteries are rechargeable and uh, extra supplies should be carried with the patient at all times, wherever they go. Now, anticoagulation using vitamin K antagonist is recommended for the duration of device placement or implant. And I would like to add that data vitamin K should be consistent to improve what we call the time in therapeutic range of PT to INR ratio. Now, significant life cell adjustments are required for patients after LVAD implantation or placement. And I would like to reiterate the fact that extensive counseling should be performed prior to hospital discharge for such patients. Then I would like to add that such patients should be instructed to connect the LVAD to a wall outlet when sleeping, as they may not hear the low battery alarms in the course of their sleep. I would also like to remind you that the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation Guidelines recommend notifying the, your power supplier, the electrical company supplying you with power of the need for uninterrupted power for this life-sustaining uh, medical equipment. So my highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If this video benefited you in any way, Please remember to give it a thumbs up and to like it and to share it widely with your peers. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing it and for listening to me. And I sincerely appreciate your partnership and your continued support and kind collaboration. I look forward to interacting with you in part 65 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series. Thank you very much.